next year on the program. Alex lives in Elkins. He knows about rolling hills and mountains himself. Alex, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you today? I'm actually in Wood County now. I've, I've lived in uh, two different counties in the district during the race. I'm trying to, to live in every county before the end here. <laughs> you know, few politicians make that kind of a commitment. That, that's good. that is a threshold that will be rarely matched in the future. That's, you know what? I'll tell you this, though. Real estate agents are rejoicing at that thought. 55 different counties there's about 27 28 in the second 27 in the second correct. yeah that and the uh the household movers they see this as a real bonanza <laughs> at his age he, he moves himself i remember being what are you 27 i wish no 32 32 okay so 32 yeah 32 i was still helping uh friends move and still helping getting friends to help me move right? yeah i think the benchmark is like 33 that a pizza and a six pack is, no is more not, <laughs> not gonna help you with the move anymore no. yeah yeah well alex you got two down 25 to go and you've only got six days to continue moving around your your district so you got a lot of movement to do Real. buddy <laughs> yeah man all right so this is your your first uh run at a big seat like uh congress uh, and we're nearing the end here, six days to go. What do you think about the experience so far? It's been an incredible experience to meet West Virginians uh, all across these 27 counties has been a true honor. Um, we're excited to come into the end here. Uh, many West Virginians, when I first started this race, were thinking, wow, you know, 30-year-old running for Congress, very little track record. And West Virginians in the 2nd Congressional District over the last year and a half have come to find out that I'm a great candidate to go represent us in Washington, D.C. I'm the fighter that we need, and I'm a generational change. I'm from the state, and uh, we're going to fight like hell here toward, towards the end, like we have been the last couple of weeks. What's your plan over these last six days? Where will you be? Well, we were with Mark Curtis yesterday. We're going to have a, a spot that airs this weekend on Inside West Virginia Politics here with you guys this morning. Going to be in the panhandle for, for most of the rest of the day, and then uh, we'll be heading back to Wood County. I've got to go do our final kind of sign run and fill uh, where where some of our signs have stayed up for three or four months and and uh, yours haven't been stolen or taken down. No, I we've we've done very well with our signs staying up. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we've had some removed, like just about every candidate out there has. But uh, we've had some signs up in the district for for four four and a half months. So we used the high quality stakes, which allowed ours to stay up, I think, a little bit better than the than the other opponents. Cement footers also. Yeah. Help. <laughs> it might be our first campaign, but we know what stakes to use for our signs. That's and, for sure. And you stay out of the roadside easement. A lot of people tend to put the signs there. Yeah, I, I would really, you know, and you guys can jump on your legislative friends here in the Panhandle, but we we need a we need a relook at that law from 2022 that cracks down on campaigning and electioneering from a sign standpoint you know in ohio you can put a sign anywhere you want uh west virginia they seem to have really restricted it recently so we definitely want to take a look at that that's definitely a a law that in favors the people in power so miss maria <laughs> so talk a little bit about um about what it's like for a 32 year old to run a campaign relatively unknown throughout the state a name that um, that people haven't really heard too terribly much. Um, tell us what that's like and then what people are telling you when you go to see them. Yeah, so, you know, when we started this campaign a year and a half ago and, and we hit the circuit right out of the gate, you know, as soon as we announced, we started going and visiting frontline Republicans. We hit all of our counties fairly early in the campaign process. Um, and it's, like I said, been a true honor to travel around and speak to West Virginians. Unfortunately, the circumstances that the nation is in right now are, are not fortunate. So instead of going out and talking to people about how the country's doing well or how their communities are thriving or how their children are excelling, uh, we're hearing a lot of the opposite. We're hearing uh, an unemployment assault that the district's under currently. You know, if you look at the job losses in the northern panhandle uh, with, with what used to be Weirton Steel, now Cleveland Cliffs, you look at the job losses in Grant County with uh, Allegheny Hardwood, uh, products. I've talked to mothers that can't feed their children. I've uh, spoken with parents that are horrified about this transgender uh, mental illness that's gripping our society. And our people need hope and they need to look into the future of the 21st century in West Virginia. And our candidacy has given them that hope. Uh, so, so let me jump in. So do you think then all of the all of the dire circumstances are caused 
by what's happening in Washington, by the by President Biden, because we've had a Republican um, everything um, throughout the the rest of the the state. So talk a little bit about that. Where's that coming from? Yeah, at 32 years old, I don't recognize my country. We have a wide open border. We're not uh, respecting the sovereignty of the United States. We've shut off our energy independence. Uh, we don't want to rely on our God-given natural resources to fuel our economy uh, and employ our people. Uh, they're peddling a green energy myth. Uh, our streets are overrun in major cities in this country with crime and decay. And that is absolutely at the foot of the Biden administration. And I believe that they will historically go down as probably the worst administration in our, in our nation's history. It's amazing what they've been able to do to the American people in four short years, not even quite four years. Uh, West Virginia, however, is always been a state that has had problems defined by decay, uh, also defined by the same old political network that's dominated the state for 50 years. And one of the things that people were and are still very excited about with our candidacy and, and, and our campaign is that we're giving West Virginians for the first time in their lifetimes, old or young, a real choice. You can send somebody that is not bought and paid for. You can send somebody that's on the front lines of the Joe Biden economy and know what it's like to provide for a family. And you can send somebody that has a natural ability to execute the second congressional district for the people and give them the real representation that they need. It's no secret, I don't think we've been represented well in West Virginia for my 32 years. Uh, and it's been like that for a while. So our, our, our campaign has given a lot of people hope and it's given them another option, another choice. We're right now internally surging uh, from a polling standpoint with young and older voters. We're bringing a lot of people into, this, into the political process that hadn't been there before. Um, and we're getting a lot of votes. I'm, I'm receiving text messages, phone calls every day um, since early voting has started where, where people were voting for us. So don't believe any of the polls. They're all fake. Um, I can call the same 400 Republicans that have voted for 30, 40 years in this state and tell you what the numbers are going to be. But they're not taking into account a lot of West Virginians that are disinfected. They're voting for the first time because they see what's going on at their school. They see what's going on in their community, and, and they're excited for change, and, and I'm definitely that, that representation. Have you, have you done internal polling? Do you have any polling yes. at all? Yes. Would you be willing to tell us what the results are? Yeah. Right okay. now, we are surging with younger and older voters. What do you mean by surging? I know what the term means, but what quantitatively, what are you talking about? So the polls that we're conducting, we're interviewing people that have voted, and we're getting back information that they voted for us. So in the internal polling, we're surging with younger and older voters. But no real, no numbers just yet, other than just a qualitative feel that you sure. uh, get in some interest. Yeah, and, and I, I think that Mr. You know, Riley could be in some trouble here. I think he might know it a little bit. If I was in a position where I had so much support and so many voters, I'd be out there right now releasing the data, showing you, hey, you know, we're winning. This is how much we're winning by. This is who we're turning out. These are the blocks we're strong with. We haven't gotten any information on that. The last poll that was done in this race showed over 30% of people were undecided and another 40% would vote for Alex Mooney if they were given the opportunity if he were to run. Of course, he didn't run. He ran for U.S. Senate. So by my estimation, there's roughly 60% of people out here that are up for grabs. Alex Gass, Rudolph, our guest here on the program, candidate in the second congressional district. This is the seat, as he referenced earlier, Alex Mooney currently holds, but Alex is running for the uh, Senate seat and uh, is uh, challenging Jim Justice in the uh, Republican primary here. So, uh, Alex, you mentioned the Biden administration, and uh, we hadn't talked about the Trump administration uh, yet with you as he's looking to become president once again, but is currently undergoing a whole lot of other issues uh, that are happening. He is the head of the Republican Party, uh, like it or not. Some people love President Trump, some people don't. Uh, your thoughts on the leadership he is providing for the party and as it flows down to the local races? Yes. Yeah, so, so Donald Trump, I believe, is the only person right now in American politics that can step into the Oval Office on day one and restore respect for the United States around the world. I believe he's the only candidate that has a plan and has succeeded in securing the border, in 
allowing West Virginians to keep more of the money that they're making as opposed to having to shell it out at the gas station or the grocery store or to the landlord that just raised your rent. Uh, there is a tremendous opportunity for the next four years of a Trump administration to right the country. The, the damage that Joe Biden and the neo-Marxist third term of Obama's administration has, has done, I mean, as I told a group in Wood County the other night, 12 out of the last 16 years have been dominated by the neo-Marxist doctrine, the, the leftist agenda in Washington, D.C. And, and the damage that Biden has caused, the finishing of, of Obama's two terms, is going to create 10 to 20 years of major problems for the United States, just the damage he's done in three and a half years. So it's imperative that Donald Trump comes in and corrects that, and I believe he's the only candidate that has the ability to do that right now. Uh, so we absolutely have to vote for Donald Trump. Uh, I don't believe that there's any politician that can fix us as fast as we need fixed other than Donald Trump. Uh, Alex, occasionally we have a guest on that's a Republican, but we accuse them they sound very much like a Democrat. That's not the case with you. <laughs> You're a solid uh, Republican. Uh, it's awful easy to say that uh, all the problems going to take 20 or 30 years to fix. Uh, and I don't want to get in the point counterpoint with you, but I, I know there's a lot of the statistics say that uh, that we were losing colleagues in the Trump administration. Uh, we were the our deficit was started going up under the Trump administration. Uh, I get you're kind of dismissing these and putting everything, all of the world's problems, all of our problems, at the foot of Biden. Uh, be Pacific. Yeah. So I definitely disagree with the way that Donald Trump and the administration handled the response to the pandemic. I think that the direct depositing of money into Americans' bank accounts was a signal uh, to, the, to the left, to the neo-Marxists, that, hey, we're close to being able to propagate a universal income. When the government starts depositing money directly into people's bank accounts in a time of crisis like that, you're, you're, you're going into unchartered territory. Uh, and then, obviously, the, the money that was spent in response to the pandemic, I believe, was extremely wasteful. Um, I know businesses that got dollars from the federal government, and their, their business model actually thrived during the pandemic. It actually picked up. Uh, so, so I think that those two situations, the response to the pandemic and the, the printing of money, uh, was, was wrong in the Trump administration. And I hope that uh, they would have learned their lesson uh, previously. But comparisons have been made. And how close the analogy is, I don't know. Uh, but the comparison been made in the late, 1930, late 1920s, early 1930s, where the government under Hoover set back and did practically nothing. And that resulted in nearly 10 years, or at least eight or nine years, of a depression. Uh, there, the argument has been made that the, the action that both Trump and Biden took avoided this eight or nine years of slash depression. Do you feel that? No, I don't. Not, you disagree. I don't. Okay. I, I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to ha we're coming to a crossroads in this nation, where pretty soon we're going to be unable to pay the interest by mid-century. Uh, we have a government that has no idea how to properly fund itself, and we have to stand up now for physical responsibility. And when I go to Washington D.C., that's one of the things that I'm going to do. Does that include Medicare and Social Security? Yes. Yeah. Okay, what well, would you do to Medicare and Social Security? Well, Social Security needs to stay what it, where it is currently. It's current form. You know, anybody that's paid into it has to has to be guaranteed those benefits. Nobody's Social Security to be touched, mainly because the government's forced you to pay it. If the government's forced you to pay this money into Social Security, it's yours, and the government has to make good on those promises. Um, on the premium, perhaps, but not on the uh, not on the um, uh, interest. Right. Yeah. So Social Security needs to needs to be tended to long term. We need to figure out. I'd like to see an opt out program for Social Security personally. You know, if if I'm 32 and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to opt out of out of this compulsory government government program. Uh, let me do it. I want to keep my own money. You know what, if I get sick or I, ha I end up on hard times and I'm in my 60s or my 70s, that's tough. 
I, I, I took the, I had the freedom and the decision to, to say no to Social Security, and here I am at the end, I might need it. But that was an individual responsibility that I took, and I have to, I have to bear the responsibility of that action. I feel like we're in a society today where there's no responsibility. Everybody has all these rights, but nobody has any responsibility to deal with the ramifications, and we're seeing where the country's going. But yeah, I smile when you say that because when I was your age, even younger, I said the same thing, and I can remember listening to a talk show, and I'm, I cannot remember the fellow's name who was hosting it. This was probably 30 years ago, and a fellow called in and said this exact same thing to him, and he said, you know, when I was younger, at your age, I said the same thing. There should be an opt-out. There's never going to be an opt-out, and the reason why there can't be an opt-out is because if you're not paying in as a 32-year-old, we're not collecting as 60, 70, 80 year olds, yeah. right? The more people would opt to not pay in, the less that's there to pay out. So the, the program itself would collapse if they allowed an opt out. Yeah. Now, they had an opportunity to reform it and, and allow uh, a more market based return, uh, but that got destroyed because whatever side proposes something, when you talk about Social Security, the other side immediately jumps on it and trashes them and makes it so that they can't talk about yeah. it right because we're going to push grandma over the cliff in her yeah. wheelchair Which what about is? the second part of the equation medicare yeah medicare needs to needs to to stay the same right now yeah so both medicare and social security remain to be uh, remain the same even though the numbers say we're going to be medicare is going to be bankrupt in uh, uh, 2032 so security they remain for the same for the people as of now that have paid into it, but we're going to have to tackle that problem longer term. Uh, that's not going to be a major focus of mine in Washington, D.C., that there's more pressing issues immediately. For um, example? The border, the omnibus, the continuing resolutions, the not returning to regular order, allowing people to stand up. And, and these are more critical than Social Security going bankrupt in, uh, in six years? Sure. Sure. No. I would argue that the border is part of the solution. Yeah. And immigration reform is part of the solution. If we're going to bring these people into the country in the volumes we are, we need to get the immigration process more streamlined. We need to get them, if they're going to be here and working, rather than pay, working for cash because they, they're undocumented, they need to be paying into Social Security because that's one way of propping up the system. If they're going to be here anyway... And we're not stopping them. They're running right past the guards. And the guards have to be like, go ahead. There you go. Here's, where the, here's the process. Yeah. So let me walk you to it. That's what we're doing right now. Right. And, and that's why we have to send people that can fight for us in Washington, D.C. The first thing that I do when I go to Washington, D.C. is I'm going to craft legislation that has three major components to secure the border. The first will be to form a mass deportation task force. We're going to have to round up 15-plus million illegals that have come into this nation and do our best to do it over the list previous Biden administration, this treasonous administration. Second component is we must send a strong message to the rest of the world and deploy the United States military to the border and authorize lethal force. Third component is- You're we, gonna shoot women and children coming across the river? We, we, they will- Because that's what that sounds like. They will be authorized to engage in lethal force if it so needs to be. As opposed to... So is that a yes or a no on the women and children, Alex? No, we're not going to shoot women and tr children at the border, but we will shoot military-aged males that don't comply. And that would send a strong message to the rest of the women and the children and the rest of these people that are coming into our country from the third world, like the prisons in Venezuela, that you're not going to come into this country without any rules and ramifications. Think about what that's going to look like. You've got dad, mom, kid coming across the river. You're going to shoot the dad in front of the mom and kid? Because he's military aged? No. That's what you just said. People that are aggressors and that are not complying. If, if, if dad keeps coming and doesn't listen to a lawful order, then yes, dad will have to be dealt with. I'm not saying we're going to shoot people no, you did. randomly. <laughs> you just said that. We may, we, yes, we may have to use, we need to have lethal force authorized on the border, which will deter people from coming in. And then, of course, if they don't comply, then we'll, we'll use lethal force as needed. It's not going to be, I mean, there's going to be so, so, some rules of engagement. So you're, you're putting the discretion at some 21-year-old buck private with a gun in his hand of who they'll shoot and when they'll shoot. No, I, the United States military. Alex, I'm going to get you out of this mess because we're out, <laughs> because we're out of time. I think you stepped in a little bit there, buddy. No, I've... <laughs>
Hey, you got a, you got a minute left. Go ahead and tell people why they should vote for you. Yeah, definitely come out and vote for Alex Gasserud on May 14th. We're going to take this country back. We're going to bring generational change to West Virginia. We're going to stand up to the people that hate the country and that are emboldened to chant death to America. We're going to take on an administration that hates the country, secure the border, get back to regular order, stop allowing this government to recklessly spend your tax dollars everywhere but here. Hey, Alex, good to see you again. Thanks, Rob. It is 9.02. This segment of the program brought to you in part today by Parsons Ford of Martin.